So I've been working um, in this is sort of block diagram of my life. I've worked in two main areas. One is software for user interfaces, which we're not going to talk about today. And the other is new kinds of user interface, new ways of interacting with computers. And the good news is as <coughs> new ways come along, they often require new software techniques. So this guarantees sort of full employment. Each one of these generates one of those. I have a student currently sort of on this end of the track. <clears throat> but I've worked on a number of, of uh, different kinds of new interaction techniques, but I've done this for long enough that new is a moving target. So, but lately, for the last number of years now, I've been working specifically on brain-computer interfaces, <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but differently from, well, let's start with a general overview. So this is a picture actually from Tufty, the visualization guy, um, describing human-computer interaction as, um, he describes two powerful information processors loosely defined, connected to each other by a narrow bandwidth channel. The limit in what can be accomplished is usually not the processing power on either side, but this very narrow channel between the user and the computer. So our goal in human-computer interaction is to improve the bandwidth across that channel. Lately, the bandwidth is much greater in this direction than in this direction. So I've been interested in improving it in this direction. However, just try to guess how many people are old enough to remember. A time, anyone remember this picture? Um, anyone for, uh, <coughs> so at one point, bandwidth in both directions was about equal. So this was one of the earliest devices used for interactive computing, the teletype. <coughs> um, and it was like a typewriter, it printed on paper, and it worked at 10 characters a second in each direction. So in and out was about the same. Now it's just way, way different. You have a keyboard and a mouse and you're just showered with multimedia and bits everywhere. So, um, but there was a time when the two were equal. For extra credit, anyone know those two people in the picture? Dennis and Ken. Good job, yes. Yes, uh, Thompson and Ritchie who created Unix, which uh, you may now think of as the predecessor of Linux. Mm. Anyway, um, thank you. Uh, okay, so <coughs> there's a thread of, of uh, um, some people call lightweight, we're calling implicit. They have a bunch of different names. These are all different names for a type of interface that pulls information out of the user and brings it to the computer, usually without asking the user to do anything specific. It just happens. <coughs> um, th these names are not exact synonyms, they're kind of overlapping Venn diagrams, but <coughs> there's an area of physiological computing. Long ago, Jacob Nielsen called these non-command interfaces. These are all interfaces where you don't explicitly do things, or in addition to what you explicitly do, you do some extra things, and the computer just pulls the data in. <coughs> so that's where I've been focusing. So most people, oh, oh. <coughs> there's a, a w bunch of different ways to do it. We've been using sensors, um, brain sensors, but there, there are various ways to collect this kind of information. But it's always a problem that in any, ca in any situation like this, the user didn't really mean to say whatever you thought they said. Uh, it wasn't explicit, and so you have to react in a very gentle way. Um, I used to work on eye tracking, and where you move your eyes, for most people, you don't even think about where you move your eyes until you sit in a lecture where you talk about it. But um, most of the time, you don't think about where your eyes are. And if every time you moved your eyes, we opened up a new window, closed an app, sent a message, it drive you nuts. So, uh, you know, I could stare, or something I can stare, I could stare at that fire alarm for a while. I'd be really surprised if I could make it go off by just staring at it. You don't expect these things to happen. Um, so I uh, called this long ago Midas Touch. Anyone remember King Midas? Everything he touched turned to gold. For a little while, that was really cool, but very quickly it became very annoying. And that's, so you have to be very, so eye tracking is the same. Um, so you have to be very careful about how you use these inputs. You have to take them uh, very gently. So, um, <coughs> when I worked on eye movements, we had kind of, uh, I, I was trying to base the work on what people naturally do with their eyes, or we call this reality-based interaction in retrospect. <coughs> and most work on eye movements, um, this is going somewhere, there, our brain stuff is analogous to this very closely. Um, most work on eye movements was aimed at disabled users. These are people who are very paralyzed, like they can't move anything except their eyes. Arms and legs don't work. Um, 
And for them, you, you give them sort of what we would consider an awkward interface. You know, look over there, blink twice, do something. But it's incredible. That gives them a power that they didn't have before. And of course, so you ask them to do something unnatural. And the computer responds, of course, in a way that the real world doesn't respond. It's very hard to find examples of things in the real world that respond to eye movements. I can stare at someone, sorry. Uh, I can stare at someone and they'll probably react. Um, but there's not much else. Uh, so there, the, there have been some work, um, Roll Vertigo, for example, did some where the thing, the uh, media device that you're looking at receives the click from the uh, remote control, so it knows which one you're talking to. But there's not much to draw on here. So we picked a middle ground where you don't move your eyes in a special way. You just do whatever you do with your eyes. But the computer responds in a way that the real world does not respond to eye movements. Um, and I've tried to do exactly the same with brain input. I'm going to not ask you to do anything special. Um, brain input is, uh, brain computer interfaces are most widely used for disabled users. And now they're really disabled, they can't even move their eyes. There's a small population of people who can't move anything. They're incredible stories. These people are, often their brain functions perfectly. So you can imagine this is really annoying. Your brain is perfect and you have no way to get any information out. And um, these, they cut your head open, put some electrodes in, and suddenly you can communicate and it's like, oh my god, I can talk to people. Like, it's, it's absolutely life-changing. But it's a very, very small number of people. So I focused on the opposite. Uh, sorry, and nobody else would ever use this interface. First, you have to have your head cut open, but um, <clears throat> no one else would ever consent to this. So we're trying to do the opposite. We're saying, don't even think about our system. Don't worry about imagining moving your foot or anything. Just do whatever you do, and we'll get some information from your brain and use that as extra input to the computer and try and do something sensible with it. So we'll leave your brain doing the normal stuff, <coughs> and then we'll respond in a way that the real world doesn't normally respond. <coughs> Excuse me. So that puts us in a very small corner of the brain-computer interaction world. Um, anyone worked on brain-computer interaction or familiar with the literature on it? Um, so the vast majority <coughs> of BCI, as I mentioned, is for this disabled, severely disabled population. Um, and we're, we figured enough people are doing that, we'll do something completely different. Um, so we're aiming at people who are already using a mouse and keyboard, but we could get some extra information out of their head. Um, and we'll call it, we call this an implicit user interface. Um, the other thing we're doing in my lab differently from others, which is an orthogonal issue, is most, e uh, most brain computer interfaces use EEG, electroencephalogram. <coughs> you put electrodes on your head. Excuse me, we're using near infrared spectroscopy instead, um, not because it's better or worse, but because it's different, it hasn't been studied as much, and I have a colleague at Tufts who's one of the pioneers in that field, so we thought, um, let's, let's dig somewhere where they haven't, as a scientist, where they haven't been digging for 100 years, which is EEG, let's, let's dig somewhere new. Um, it's, it's neither better nor worse, it's just different. Um, with anyone familiar with FNews? She is. Oh, good. Um, so you shine light into your head, um, there's a, you thought your head was opaque, but there's a band of, of light right around infrared, slightly visible, um, that will penetrate through your skull. Um, the light goes in, it's absorbed or not by the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin flowing in, in the blood flowing just under the skull, and then you measure the light coming back out. So you shine light in, you put a probe about so far away, and it measures the light coming back out. It's not a heck of a lot of light, but it's enough to determine the amount of oxygen, or the concentration of oxygen and um, deoxygen and hemoglobin in your blood. <coughs> the measure it gives is similar to an fMRI, which measures the same thing, blood oxygenation, and gives you a local picture of what's, how much um, energy the brain is consuming in a particular spot. So it's very localized, unlike EEG, <coughs> um, and it tells you how much the brain is using. It only works near the surface, about so deep, um, because the light is just too dark if you go in any further. So unlike fMRI, which measures the whole brain, this only measures near the surface. In our case, we've been sticking to the forehead. We've just added another probe for the side, but mostly we stick to the forehead because um, there's an awful lot going on in this part of your brain that's interesting, and it's much easier to do where you don't have hair. So, it's, so that's what we use for it. So we're using what's called FNIRS, or near functional near-infrared spectroscopy. <coughs> um, 
and it's, it's a relatively new technique. Uh, the, um, I should also mention the phenomenon that it measures. So your brain works harder, it calls for more blood, takes several seconds to occur. So it's inherently a very slow measure. It has nothing to do with the equipment, it just that's how, how long the, um, your body takes to do this. <coughs> Unlike EEG, so EEG is very precise in time. Um, when something happens, you get a measurement right away, but very imprecise in space. You put a probe here, and EEG is measuring half your head. Um, uh, FNIR is the opposite. It's very precise in space, but not in time. So um, that's, that's how they compare. Uh, so it's the another benefit is it's quite easy to... Ah. Okay, you don't need the cheesy music. <coughs> That's the device we use. <coughs> um, it's connected by fiber optic cables to this little rubber pad that goes on the user's head. As you can see, a pack of fiber optic cables coming out. They carry the light to the head and then back out. You put this pad on your head. You put a, like a sports headband around your head. And that's it. That's the setup. Anyone been a subject in the EEG experiment in the psych department? Yeah. So it's, it's even easier than that. Um, EEG requires more precise electrode placements and that awful grease that you have to go shampoo afterwards. Mm. So, so it's pretty easy to set up. The equipment we're using, you saw the box a little while ago, <coughs> is quite expensive, but there's nothing in it that really should cost any money. So we believe that in the future, you can make a cheap one. If I tell you that you're going to have a cheap fMRI someday, yeah, not so much. <coughs> so, um, so we did an experiment initially just to get a sense of whether we can measure anything going on in the brain. This was 10 years ago when Audrey was working with me, and people didn't know if this was really measuring anything interesting. <coughs> so we worked on an experiment where um, you had to use your short-term memory. So. Um, this is the kind of memory where I tell you a phone number and you're trying to remember it, 3331212, you're sort of holding it in memory. Um, in this particular task, you had to tell how many, how many surfaces of each color there were in the cube, but you could only see one surface at a time. So you could see this surface and you go, all right, one blue, three yellow, one blue, three yellow. And that's all you could see. And then it turns and you can only see this one. You go, all right, I had three yellow before, now I have four yellow and so on. Um, so you had to rehearse this or keep it in your memory. And some cubes had only two colors, so it's easy. Some had three or four. So we wanted to see if we could detect a difference in this probe. And the answer was yes, otherwise we wouldn't have gone very far with this. Um, not perfectly, obviously, but you know, somewhere between, I don't know, so somebody hit 100%. The different colors are different people. Uh, this person on this task was, uh, was 50. Uh, which is chance. So we're sort of, I don't know how you want to describe that, but um, considerably better than average. And that's going to be the case. We may be able to improve our measurements, but we're never going to get 100%. A mouse is pretty close to 100%. You know, when the mouse moves, you're pretty, and the, the computer gets a signal that the mouse has moved, you're pretty confident that the mouse actually moved. With this kind of input, you're never sure. So we have to design interaction techniques that will work around this problem. Which means we want to do something which, if we guess right, it'll be helpful. And if we guess wrong, it won't be too bad. So we have to keep that in mind. <coughs> so, our, so we now have um, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, we now have a hammer and we're looking for nails. Um, we have a technique that can measure the amount of activity. So we're not measuring what the number you're saying, 3331212. We're measuring how much is going on here. So we could say how, how many things you're remembering, for example. Um, that's what we can do, and the question is, what do we do with that? <coughs> so we've been looking for places where we could demonstrate these ideas. Um, so some of the things we measure with short-term memory, we sort of were able to separate verbal and uh, um, uh, graphical or spatial uh, verbal workload. Uh, Audrey did a nice study on difficulty of, ga of the game. She made Pac-Man harder and easier, and yes, you could detect it in the brain. Uh, multitasking works pretty nicely. Multitasking, as you can imagine, is relatively closely related to short-term memory. When you switch tasks, you kind of hold some of the other tasks in your memory. So they're all happening up here. Um, we got a measurement of preference, but it's not a very strong measurement. So this is the toolbox, and now our challenge is to figure out what are we going to do with it. So our input comes from the mouse and keyboard, as usual, um, plus whatever effect this task has on the human, 
causes their brain to do something. Um, both of those inputs go to the computer and both of those affect the interface um, in real time. Most uh, uh, BCI, uh, well, many studies of brain um, are retroactive. So <coughs> you run the experiment, you analyze the data, and then you figure out what's happening. We have to do something in real time because we're making an interactive system. This often constrains the way we can analyze the data. If we could see the entire stretch of data, we could analyze it better because we could find the beginnings and ends of different events. Um, we can't do that. We have to make a decision in real time. It's not a matter of computer processing speed. It's a matter of, I haven't seen all the data, but I need to respond. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here's um, an example. This was Audrey's project <coughs> where we, um, she made a complete end-to-end -end system that this is the first time we had done this um, that took the input in, processed it in real time, and had it feed, give out output um, you know, in real time. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so just to give you an idea, this is the kind of data you get. These are three different, con three colors are three different conditions in this particular experiment, different experiment. Um, this is time, this is uh, 40 seconds across one of these charts. So you can imagine, as you can see, when a task, a new task begins, you can't tell a thing because it's just started. And then gradually the, the, um, the different conditions diverge. Um, so you can see this condition is easily distinguishable from that condition, these two, eh. um, and they, they diverge better over time. So it'd be nice if you could wait 5, 10, even 20 seconds to get a nice clean signal. So that's, that's what we're contending with. But, um, but you have to look at this not as what are the imperfections and the ways in which FNIRS isn't a perfect measure, but it's more than you knew before. Normal computer knows nothing about your brain. We know something. It's not perfect. We know something. So you got to look at the glasses half full, not the glasses half empty. <coughs> so this was a later experiment, but it's the most uh, straightforward one to describe. Um, this is a simulator or a control console for drone airplanes, UAV, like unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, it's a lot like a video game. So the, the little airplanes they, um, have to drive around. And there are a bunch of restrictions. You're not supposed to go there. You're not supposed to go here. Um, the restrictions change over time. So this was you couldn't go there, but now it's OK to go there. So the drones all have, have uh, places they're supposed to go. And you're monitoring several of them. Um, apparently, currently, um, currently, a drone pilot pilots one airplane, or possibly even two pilots pilot one airplane. Um, in the future, one person will pilot several airplanes. So this becomes a lot like a video game. Um, you're not controlling each airplane with a wheel. You're giving them instructions. You're saying, all right, you go over there, and they start going. And then you go over there, and then you've got to check back, um, like a time-sharing task. You've got to check back, oops, there's a target over here. You've got to move, or a blockade. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that's going on. So you're doing multitasking. You're switching from one to the other. And the question is, how many airplanes should we give you to control? Um, and one way would be to have a little slider that asks you, so how busy are you? Is this too much work? Is this too little work? But that'd be really annoying to have to adjust that constantly. So this is where BCI comes in. Um, we can measure how busy you are, and we can make the adjustment without really annoying you too much. <clears throat> so we take the same measure of oxygenation um, in the forehead. And when it seems like you're, you have too much work to do, we take away an airplane. It, presumably there's a team, and the airplane is given to your team member. <clears throat> and the adjustment is made when you're operating on another airplane, so it's not too distracting. When you're not busy enough, you might get bored. We give you an extra airplane. So we're trying to sort of keep you in the zone, not too bored and not too overloaded. That's, that's the premise here. Um, it can't be simply by the number of airplanes, because it might be that um, 10 airplanes are all going in the same direction, and it's easy. Or two airplanes are all going to hit each other. You suddenly have to pay attention. So it's not just the number of airplanes. It's not, uh, it may be whether you got a good night's sleep last night. So um, all these things factor in. And the only way to find out is to measure. <coughs> so we obtain the data from the FNIRS device. <coughs> we do a bunch of filtering. Um, so every time you take a breath, you bring oxygen into your body. <coughs> every time your heart beats, you get more blood pumping through. And those are irrelevant to brain function. So we have to filter those out. But fortunately, they happen at known frequencies. Um, so we do a bunch of filtering. And then the next step is we use machine learning. Um, we've used a variety of different machine learning um, techniques. On this project, Lib uh, it was SVM. 
<coughs> so we, we, we run uh, a cl calibration um, run first where we give you something of high workload and low workload. Um, anyone familiar with the NBAC task in psychology? This is a test of short-term memory where you have to remember something. It's kind of like the, the thing with the cube, but it's a standard task that's fairly widely used. So we use that one a lot. <coughs> we see something, you see something else, and you have to remember if this one is like that one. So we give you that task with a low numbered n and a higher numbered n, so it becomes more difficult. So we got a task that requires less short-term memory and more short-term memory. We you sit down and do that for a while. We take the data from it. We make a machine learning classifier, and then we feed it live data, and it says high workload, low workload. So that's, that's the technique we're generally using. <coughs> um, all right. And our, our goal, so we have no way of knowing switch back here for just a sec. We have no way of knowing whether this whole process is measuring your brain correctly because we don't actually know what's going on in your brain. We don't have ground truth in this. Um, in one of our experiments we gave NASA TLX, uh, which is a questionnaire that asks you basically how busy are you, but it's a widely standardized questionnaire. <coughs> so we have, you can try and do other things. You can measure performance, how well the user did, but basically we, there's nothing we can do to be absolutely sure that our measurements are correct. Um, they're just, you know, we can't cut open your head and find out what's going on. So our measurement, and, and I don't want to do, sorry, subjective measurements where we say, did you like our system? Um, because I'd like to do something a little stronger than that. So what well, instead we've been able to measure is objective performance. So this is a task. You have to get the airplanes from here to there. If you do it faster, it's better. It's better not to hit the run into the cliff and so on. <coughs> so there's a bunch of measurements just like in a video game. And I'm looking for some performance improvement. Not a gigantic improvement because I mentioned that we can't get, we can't make huge changes So based on brain input. So. Um, and in this case, I think the one was errors. You know, they did better on errors. They did made less errors. So we're looking for a performance improvement sort of end to end, um, rather than uh, tr we can't tell whether the steps are working correctly. <coughs> if we don't get a performance improvement, we don't know if it's because the brain measurement is working wrong or something else went wrong. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I think we were the only research group at that time working on drone airplanes not funded by the Department of Defense. We had no particular interest in drones, um, but this console had been built separately and um, was a good example for us to work on. We also at that time had a bunch of, of press publicity and I had to keep telling all the students and myself, don't say drone, don't say drone, just say airplane. Because <laughs> really the thing has nothing to do with drones, it just is like a video game. <coughs> so another. Um, uh, another uh, study we did was uh, detecting a, um, sort of multitasking. So this is, as I said, closely related. We, we kind of mine the fMRI literature, and we look, you know, in fMRI literature, they give you that picture of the head, and they color in different parts. So we're looking for ones where the part they colored in is the forehead. So if, if they can detect something on the forehead, we're interested. And this was based on an fMRI study. <coughs> so um, if you're interrupted, you're doing a task, and you're interrupted, sometimes it's a simple, repetitive task, like bang, bang, bang. And if I interrupt you, no problem, you go back, you can pick up where you left off. Other kinds of interruptions, you're in the middle of something complicated, maybe you're doing computer programming or composing a message. If I interrupt you, it's going to take a while to get back. There's some context that has to be held. Um, so we're able to detect that, the difference between those two cases at the moment of the interruption. So we thought, let's use that for something. So again, we had this same pipeline of this pre-processing. We do a training, a machine learning training, and then um, create a machine learning model, and then run it um, live. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so in this case, the user was controlling two robots. It's another kind of time-sharing task. These are, this is the robot eye view of one robot. That's a robot eye view of another robot. It's a simulator. There's no actual robots here. <coughs> Oh, excuse me, and it's another closed-ended task. The robot has to move along, check the power level of whatever, uh, and then find the spot with the best power and make a transmission. Imagine it's a Mars rover, it's looking for the best spot, or something like that. <coughs> so, um, the idea was when you're getting busy, 
we'll put one of the robots on autopilot so that you don't have so much work to do. The assumption here and everywhere is that the autopilot is less good than when you're driving it yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't use this at all. You just always put it on autopilot. So when you're too busy, we'll put it on autopilot. <coughs> and when it's on autopilot, you only have to drive one airplane. <coughs> one robot, sorry. Right. Uh, so. <clears throat> the other thing we did, this was an early on uh, experiment early on, we thought, wait a minute, what if this is just all hocus pocus? What if everything coming out of this machine is really just noise and we're sort of reading tea leaves here? Um, so we thought, let's try, um, so one condition would be, of course, when you get busy, we turn on autonomy for one of the two robots. Let's try it backwards. Let's just plug it in backwards, and when you're busy, we'll give you more work to do, and when you're less busy, we'll give you less work to do, just as a sanity check to see if, like, this is all just nonsense. Um, and indeed, um, it worked. So, <coughs> this was, so in this case, higher on the bar chart is better, and this was when the robot um, followed your brain or adjusted to your brain, and this was when the robot what was we called maladaptive, when it was backwards. So, so it did have an effect in the direction you'd hope. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, we took a bunch of other measurements of it, and um, but roughly speaking, uh, doing this caused better, objectively measured performance. Right. Um, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's another place. Um, stop me if you have questions, if you want. <coughs> So here's another um, uh, experiment we did. This is a little, uh, a weaker measure and a little more subtle, but uh, it still gave us results. Um, you can get a kind of preference measure with FDAs. It's kind of like economic preference. Would you buy a Pepsi? Would you buy a Coke? Kind of that kind of preference. Um, so we showed people um, uh, IMDB pages for movies. So it's like a movie poster. And we tried to predict how well they would like the movie. So rather, or how well they would like the poster. Nobody, there were no actual movies in this thing. Um, so we show you a page, and then we try to guess whether you like it or not. And we can do that with some modest accuracy, usable accuracy. The same idea, we acquire the data and classify it. And, <coughs> and then we feed the output. So this is, you look at the, the web page, you, the, thing, the machine decides whether you're going to like that, whether you like that picture. And then it feeds it into a movie recommender, like Netflix, but open source, obviously. Um, and then it recommends another movie. So there's actually two bits of machine learning going on here. <coughs> so you look at the web page, the IMD page. You, um, we also asked you to tell us how well you liked it. But we, did, we didn't use that data. We just used that to check up and see if our thing was working. We used the implicit rating and then used that to determine the next movie that you saw. And uh, actually, this one's easier to see. Um, so this is in the no brain condition, or no adaptive condition. Over time, the movies, you continue to see movies that you liked about the same, like the movies didn't get better. Um, in the other condition, over time, the movies you saw were ones you preferred more because this thing was adapting to your preferences. This is another, I'm uh, oh sorry, and um, it was, it turned out, we looked later, it was not simply giving more popular movies over time, it was giving individualized choices. Um, these were movie, uh, those preferred movies toward the end were different for, across most of the people. And our favorite anecdote was someone in the experiment said, could I go back and write that movie down? I think I'd really like it. So, um, so something was going on um, th that seemed, that gave us what we considered better performance. This is another case where it would just be too much trouble to keep setting a knob. We're trying to just pull out your preferences without bothering you. The way web pages go floating by, and we just guess. We don't have to interrupt you. That, that's sort of a general theme in this work. <coughs> Anyone familiar with bubble cursor? Huh. That, that sort of came and went. And it was a fad in user interface uh, interaction techniques for a while. Um, the idea here, anyone familiar with Fitz Law? Yes, all right. So the idea here is you can, um, it's a way to beat Fitz Law. So if I'm, I mean, you can't actually beat Fitz Law if you're just moving your hand, but if you know what's on the screen, you can beat it. Um, if I'm, uh, let's say I'm here, and I start moving this, well, that's not a good example. Um, all right, let's, let's be here. And I'm starting to move this way. Do I really have to go all the way down to this target? It's the only thing in this direction. 
perhaps the system could guess that that's what I want. And that's the idea of bubble cursor. That when you start approaching something and there's nobody else in the way, just go ahead and pick it. Um, the question is, how aggressive should it be? So there's the target. Do I have to go right up to the target? Could I go up to this gray circle? Could I just go one pixel and it's already selected? That sounds a little flaky. <coughs> so the issue is, how aggressive should the bubble cursor be? How, how close do you have to get before it grabs? Um, this gray circle doesn't show up on the screen. All you ever see is that. The gray circle indicates how close you have to be to grab it. Um, and we thought, wherever we have a parameter that I, it's too much trouble to set it. I, it would be crazy if you had to set it all the time. But it'd be nice if it could figure out the right setting without me doing anything. And so that was the idea. Uh, here's, oops, let's put this back. Um, the cursor expansion technique. There's a picture of the probe use again. FNews, a non-invasive brain sensing technology to detect cognitive state. When we detect multitasking during a dual task <coughs> scenario, we increase the width of high priority targets. We found that users are <coughs> better on both <coughs> tasks with this adaptation. Okay, so it's actually, it's a fairly involved story, which I won't tell you, but we observed better performance again in a different kind of scenario. Let's look at some um, less, uh, all right, then yes, we got better results. And then this basic notion is that it's sort of like having a third hand that you don't have to think about. Okay, um, we then moved on to music. Um, so here's an area where it's much harder to evaluate. Um, in, 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 uh, you know, if you're trying to drive an airplane and the airplane has to get there, it's pretty easy to evaluate whether you got there or not and how quick you got there. But in music, there's no clear measurement. Um, we can measure kind of how good the music is, because they do that in music class all the time. If you're um, anyone a music major or minor, right? Right, so if you're a music student, they rate you. Um, but we were aiming firstly at non-professional musicians at, uh, and not music majors, but people who were just sort of playing around. And we thought, um, so, so I can't just measure how well they play or how good the music sounds with my gadget because they might be a really bad pianist or a really good pianist. So, um, so it's hard to tell just from the quality of the music. We're looking for expressivity. Did they feel like they could express themselves well? So we're really in the area of subjective measurement here. Um, but we thought we'll try this. So, uh, oops. Is so anyone familiar with this uh, automatic cheesy keyboards where you play some notes and then you just play one hand in the bass and it goes chunk, 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 plays a sort of built-in accompaniment, yes. Um, so the question is, could you turn that thing on or off, or maybe even later, could you adjust that accompaniment without having a third hand? Could the system just decide when to add accompaniment or not, um, based on brain workload? So. Um, so what we did was a very simple thing. Um, you play, so we're, we're targeting, as I said, uh, people who've taken like two years of piano years ago. It's sort of this group of amateur musicians. Um, we're asking you to play, we gave you some music, very, very simple music with sort of two fingers. And sometimes we would add some harmony notes and sometimes we wouldn't. And the harmony notes would be turned on and off by the brain signal. Um, we worked at first with music majors and they hate this stuff. Um, you know, piano major has spent 20 years of their life learning how to play a normal piano. Leave it alone, thank you very much. I don't want any of your junk. I mean, that, that, you know, they're not interested in innovations in piano or any instrument. Um, so that's not the target. All right, so let me show you uh, what we built here. We present Brahms, or Brain Automated Adaptive Harmonies in a Musical System. Brahms is a novel brain-computer interface integrated with a musical instrument. It adapts passively to users' cognitive <coughs> during musical improvisation. The system adds or removes musical harmonies based on users' cognitive state as measured with FNUs, the brain sensing technology. Our research shows that users prefer this novel musical instrument over other conditions. So it's just preference. Here, the user plays a single note with their right hand, with no adaptation by the system. Here, the system adds a note, one octave above the system, slightly reaching the sound. Here, the user plays a single note with their left hand, with no adaptation by the system. For the left hand adaptation, adds a note. So we really 
should have done it a fifth, not a third. Sorry about that. We, we did a third, which was, yeah. So there's the gadget, um, and there's the fiber optic cable running up to his head. These are shining lights, and these are receiving the light. So this guy is actually a very good musician. But Before this, so he didn't have to do anything, it just happened. Presumably at a time when he was glad that it happened. So before we did this, we had to do a study to see if playing the piano would mess up f -nears. There are just very little studies, very few studies of f -nears. Um, and we got a nice clean signal. We gave people an easy piece to play and a hard piece. We made sure they didn't move their head any more or less. And you got a nice clean sort of workload signal for the easy piece versus the hard piece. Because nobody had tried this with a piano. Nobody even tried this with a desk and a mouse. We did that also. Um, yeah, I, I should mention that was a study Audrey was part of where we wondered, can you use this device sitting at a desk with a mouse and a keyboard? Who knows? They had only been studied in the lab, sitting nice and straight. Um, so Audrey led a study where um, we had people do normal tasks, use a mouse, use a keyboard, move around. And the answer was pretty much, it's OK. Um, the one thing that messes you up, if you frown really hard, it just pushes the sensor physically away from your head, which oh, lets light leak in. But, um, so just nobody knew. They, they weren't using this in this kind of setting. Whoops. So let's try. Ah, come on. There we go. Le no. Let's try again. Learn piano with Bath, an adaptive learning interface that increases task difficulty based on brain sensing. Bath, or Brain Automated Corral, is an adaptive musical learning system based on brain sensing that helps piano players learn Bach chorales. Bach uses functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNU, which has been demonstrated by HCI researchers to measure user cognitive workload. Participants were presented with varying difficulty levels of a Bach chorale. Using Bach, we measured the cognitive workload of participants to determine when they could cognitively handle the higher difficulty levels. So when you get to that point, um, the next line shows up. <coughs> indicating that the learner could handle more information. Each level added a full line of music. Participants were given 15 minutes to learn a piece with bar and 15 minutes to learn a piece the way they normally would in a control condition. They played the pieces once all the way through at the end of the practice session. This final performance was recorded and analyzed for accuracy and speed. Right, so it's all MIDI, so you can easily do that. that. Participants played with increased speed and accuracy when they learned with Bach. Furthermore, participants said that they felt that they played better and learned more easily with Bach. Bach demonstrates that a real-time adaptive brain-computer interface can improve learning in pianists by monitoring and adapting to cognitive work. So this was another direction of using, studying learning. I'll just, so I'll briefly mention, maybe you won't mention Google Glass. Um, and, uh, whoops. So other things we've been doing lately, um, we we're, um, we're keep thinking about adding other physiological measurements. This is a device that measures uh, heart rate uh, and uh, body temperature and uh, one other thing. Oh, body, uh, 
Oh, skin resistance. Um, we played, anyone familiar with TDCS, transcranial DC stimulation? We played with that a little bit. We were uh, looking for a two-way brain interface. So we measure, go back to the airplanes, um, we measure that your workload went up, and instead of giving one of the airplanes to your team member, we give you a little zap that will improve your performance um, temporarily. Um, TDCS, ten, you, you put the DC electricity in one side of your head and take it out the other side of your head. It tends to improve or ex make the excitation level different at one part of your brain instead of another. It's, it's, um, it's a zero-sum game. It, it doesn't just doesn't make you into a superman. <coughs> but um, but it, you can emphasize the part of your brain that you need. Um, we were not able to get effects quick enough. We want an interactive system. So this is used for treating PTSD or other kinds of things. You come in, you get a treatment, you go home, and you're good for a day or a week. We wanted to tweak things very finely. When your workload goes up, we give you a little zap. It gets you, you know, a few minutes, you're all done. The workload goes back down. Um, it took us nine minutes to get, a, um, um, to get an effect. So we give you the zap, and it takes nine minutes for something to happen. And we don't know how long it takes to go away because people didn't sit still that long. So it wasn't easily adaptable to interactive. Um, it may be possible, we just sort of abandoned that line of research. Um, we currently just submitted a paper where based on your, um, on your current workload, this is everything is workload, based on your current workload, we decide how to interrupt you. Most interruption, uh, there's a lot of research on interruptions, most of it is about postponing interruptions or shutting them off. We thought let's do something different, let's change the mode <coughs> or the, uh, the, the way they're dis displayed. If you're busy, we'll give you a little thing on the side that says, click here when you can handle this interruption. If you're not busy, we'll just blast it in front of you. Because if you're not doing anything, why waste time clicking on the little side thing? Just, you know, you're, not, you're just watching cat videos, just, let's just give it to you so it'll be more efficient. Presumably these are interruptions that have some value. It's a message from your boss or whatever. Um, if they're useless, well, you know what to do. Um, and we were able to get uh, better performance in that case also. Let me quit here so there's time for questions. And let's. Oh, uh, so we are developing, uh, my colleagues in electrical engineering are developing a small version of this device. That's one. We have a newer one, but it's, we're not the only ones. There will, there will be cheap ones eventually. Uh, whoops, I want to go to the end. All right, that's not going to help. Um, I just wanted. So here's two other talks that we're not going to see today. I'm just trying to, uh, so if you have questions, go ahead and ask, and I will just, there we go. Okay. Come on. Um, put this up. There. Okay, that's the group as of after Audrey left, but before right now. <laughs> um, sometime in between. <laughs> um, questions, comments, what should we do next with this? Yes. Yeah. Um, when you were reading in the brain data from the sensor, it showed they believe three waves. They were wondering if it was within those within those three waves, is it possible to recognize the user as wanting to do multiple actions at once? I mean, the short answer is we don't know. Um, so the three colors were three different conditions in the experiment that were overlaid on the same graph. Right? So they're, they're not three waves that are being measured simultaneously. Um, they're three different conditions. The four boxes were four different sensors of the 16 total. Um, and we just take all 16 machine learning tends to select the ones that are better. Um, the, the ones that are about so far apart work better. Um, that sensor had four in a row, so you wanted kind of the one on the end. Our latest probe has them in more of a circle, so they're all the right distance. Um, and just to get you all the technical details, um, there are two probes. Each one has four, um, uh, four light sources. And each light source, if you looked very, very closely at the video, each light source has two fibers coming out of it, or each, each um, location for a light source. One has one color, and one has another color of near infrared and slightly visible. Um, the two colors distinguish oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, fMRI only can measure one of those things, so that's one small difference between FNIRS and fMRI. Yeah? I know you mentioned that you don't want to get into the software part of your work, but mm -hmm. could you just in two sentences say 
what are the things that you're doing in terms of self representation of these simplicity? Yes. Um, so, so in the past, I worked on software representations for other kinds of interfaces, like virtual reality. That uh, um, so, um, yeah. So here's the idea. Um, of course, we well, every generation of user interface software first examples were built the old-fashioned way. You know, the early graphical user interfaces were built by just putting bits on the screen. It's very tedious. And then the toolkit comes. So we're in that phase. All of the things we built were built the old-fashioned way. Um, and we're asking ourselves, what would be better? What would be a good way to build it? So our idea is there are kind of two kinds of inputs, even though they're just all read in off regular old ports. One input is the regular interaction of the user. And we describe that with a state diagram or event handler or something like that. Click here, do that. And then there's this other kind of input that seems orthogonal that comes from the brain and says, take everything you've been doing and just modify it a bit, sort of a tweak. And I want to think of the tweak as not just yet another mouse click, but as some other kind of thing. So we're thinking of sort of a family of user interface descriptions and a way to transition between them. Towards a description language that allows the UI designer to see yes. how these things are going to be combined. Yes, yes, I hope. Um, I mean, that's a, so. The goal is: can I describe? So I have this interface that can change in various ways based on brain signal, and I want to describe that family of changes separately from the way it changes when you click the mouse. So this guy, where is he? Tomoki. This guy is working on that right now. That'll be the um, his PhD thesis. So. Um, yes, another question, maybe this is your area, is there's not a lot of interest in that kind of work right now. So I started my career long ago in user interface description languages, user interface management systems. Um, we're having trouble figuring out who's going to be interested in this. Um, right, the EICS community, perhaps. But, uh, okay, yeah. So I really appreciate that you are applying this interface in different areas uh, besides um, have you considered applying this interface into, say, gameplay? Because there's a lot of work about, right now they did something called robot banding. Um, basically, is if they, the game realizes that your avatar is dying so and so often, it will make the difficulty lower automatically. Mm -hmm. But let's say if your device can detect that, like the player yep. is you very tense, like very Yep. Yeah, I think, th yeah, this is a, yeah, sorry. That would it be like one Yes. I um, mean, I feel like the, uh, the drone airplane thing was exactly like a video game. I mean, it's what you're doing is like a video game. Yes, it's a very good application. Um, gamers are another community that will probably adopt some weird gadget before the rest of us will. Um, we found it hard to get hold of a video game that we could easily tweak. They tend to be kind of closed source or complicated. But yes. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking about applying this in something like spaced repetition for learning like a language or something like that. If you, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Have you done anything like that? I haven't done it. I was very cautious when we did this um, music learning thing because I feel like I know almost nothing about learning science and I don't want to tread too far in that direction. But we got very nice results and afterwards people from that community felt like uh, came to us and felt like, yes, you could extend this to other kinds of learning. I felt we're just learning to play a piano piece. I don't know anything about regular learning. So I think the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes, this would be a good idea, and no, I didn't do it. Um, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, like, obviously, it's a huge body of research and very concentrated. There's a lot of open ended questions. And anybody thought about it from the other end of like input? Like, um, I don't know, the program, like, nudge, like, I don't play piano at all, right? So I wouldn't even know how to indicate the music. Like, there's, a, there's an Apple version on right now with the iPod where she, like, walks and then she says to Siri something like, play something all like. Is there anything for somebody like me who might want to stay on the piano and either have it guess what I might want to hear or help stimulate my brain. I know this is very far-reaching. Mm -hmm. Stimulate like the reverse, like input a brain. But you know, they talk about um, I don't know, the music, the bio, uh, different birds. Yes. Like, in quest to me, what, what 
might activate my right side to use my right hand to, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it sounds like fun. I don't really know because once it, the main thing we're measuring is this kind of short-term memory workload. So we're sort of trying to think of what to do with that. Um, the student who did that work actually also um, tried to extend it to measuring affect or emotion. And um, it's kind of tough on the forehead. You kind of want to be there. So, um, so we didn't get very good measurements, at least in her experiments. And you did one also. Yeah, it is failed. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, so we haven't gotten nice results for affect, but there's nothing to prevent us from combining several different devices, except, you know, time and effort. Um, we did one experiment once where we had FNIRs and, um, uh, and EEG running at the same time. It works fine. We just don't have the equipment anymore. There are people at uh, UCL in London who are developing probes that have an EEG sensor and an optical sensor right in the very same fiber. So they, they stick a little wire down the fiber, and they use a, a type of EEG grease that won't mess up the optical signal. So you can combine the two. Yes. Oh, sorry. Like, uh, it's a question and maybe comments at the same time. You mentioned that uh, you, you're not quite sure where, to, where this technology could be fit and in which domains or something like that. At the same time, like, you know, um, even though this is a futuristic technology, something coming to my brain now, what would you just explain? Mm. It's like uh, a mind reading uh, technology. If someone, say for example, I'm, I'm thinking to something like to do something bad, but in fact I did not execute that yet, who is, uh, who is going to be blamed? Uh. The technology itself or the best? Again, we're going back to the same, yeah. uh, you know, the same thought of the ethical questions that we, we should ask yes. if we are going to, um, you know, to upgrade or uh, uh, scale this technology further. Yeah. So this is a tricky question that sort of goes beyond the technology. Yeah. Um, if this device was connected to your personal phone, which was not connected to anything else, yeah. and just personally improved your user interface and no information was transmitted, it'd be great. If this information was connected to the national government, not so good. Uh, but that's sort of independent of the technology. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> the same applies to eye tracking. Um, yes? Um, when you were reading the movie, movies, yes. um, did you have other, did you have some movies that people haven't watched? And what were the results? And what did you show them? Did you show them a web page? Or did you show them like a uh, web page like IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes? Or did you show them something like more high quality, which is like Netflix? Or okay. We showed them IMDb pages. That's it. So they didn't, th that's all they saw was a page, exactly IMDb page for each movie. I don't know if they saw the movies or not. I, do you remember one tree of fire? It was after you, no, okay. Oh, this was Evan's, uh, Evan's project. Um, I can, I think most of the movies are ones they had not seen because they were interested in the recommendations. I don't know. Um, and it was recommendations coming from a large body of recommendations. So I guess just statistically they probably hadn't seen them. I don't know. Yeah, sure. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Not yet, because, I mean, just as a practical matter, you'd have to put this thing on the people. Um, we did have a thing where you're, you're watching a video and we're, yeah, not, not really, but we're beginning to think about education because this, this one went quite well. Um, Muse, are you familiar with Muse? Sure. Is, would you be able, like, say I was, because I know they've got lots of yeah. expensive stuff that you could add up. If I was a Muse user, would I be able to do some short-term testing online through software? Maybe. Yeah, probably. So we're doing um, FNIRS, which is a, a Muse is an EEG, okay. right? Isn't it? Am I thinking of the right thing? It's a, I yeah, it's a I cheap I EEG. There's that, there's Emotive, and there's NeuroSky, I think, are the three cheap EEGs. Um, which eh, kind of barely work. Uh, I mean, they, they're not very effective, but they get, you get something out of them, and they show that there will be cheap, there will be better cheap EEGs in the future. Um, maybe, yeah. Okay. Perhaps yes. 
So what they have done, um, what the benefit of those devices has been lots more people have been thinking about brain-computer interfaces as researchers. Um, the drawback is they're very noisy. So they'll get there. Yeah, good question. Good. Well, thank you very much. I hope to meet somebody this afternoon. <laughs>